So, uh, before we, we were recording, we were discussing important tooth things, um, <laughs> tooth removal things. Uh, JT. <laughs> tooth horrors. I can't. Man, exactly. I'm so afraid of the dentist. I don't like it at all. I tense up. They like I'm gripping the, the, the sides of the chair as they're scraping with their little scrapey things. Mm. And mm. Th- here's the thing. Oh here's why God. I'm spooked. Mm. It's I when I was younger and I got braces, I've got like very cramped teeth in my mouth. Um, mm. And so I got braces and they cranked them on so tight when I was when they were putting them on. I was like, man, this this hurts. Like, should it hurt this much? They're like, yeah, yeah, it's fine. It, you know, it's normal. Hmm. And sure enough, like a few days later, the tooth was completely black. One of my front two teeth yeah. completely. So they had crushed the inside of the tooth, like the nerve, hmm. and they killed hmm. it. And so eventually, they had to like drain the inside of the tooth and then bleach the inside of the tooth to have a normal colored tooth. Hmm. And so ever since hmm. then, I've just been petrified of going to the yeah. the dentist or the orthodontist. I don't like people messing with my teeth. <laughs> Uh, I have uh, the only way that I, I became better with dentists is because I have a distant distant family member who uh, who is a dentist, mm-hmm. uh, and she is uh, mashallah, she's fantastic. She's absolutely she's the best kind of dentist she could be, um, or any anybody could be. Uh, and every once in a while, because you're because I... you're a fucking cousin. If anybody else goes, she's probably like in there with a fucking RPG blowing the shit out of their fucking mouth. Honestly. It's always like this. You, you, you know, we always joke on this podcast about how you need a guy or yeah. a girl or whatever, but that also includes like a doctor and a fucking dentist. You need a guy <laughs> as well. Guy. Someone so actually dedicate to... time. I got and a effort. tooth guy. Yeah, yeah, I got a, I got a guy yeah. who works on the teeth. I got a tooth guy. Yeah. Like doctor, I have a, I have a bump on my on my right test. If he, if he he's not your guy, he's gonna, he's gonna be like, ah yes. oh, man, it's a pimple yeah. or whatever the fuck. But if he's your guy, you go like through twenty fucking tests, and it's all on the house. And he's like, man, like I'm gonna send you to three other doctors, mm-hmm. and like he connects you to a whole fucking town of, of like Look, experts. But if yes. he's not your guy, he's like, ah oh, yeah, yeah, get the fuck out of here. I have speaking of a guy, I have a story for you. Uh, <laughs> again, JT old. No, <laughs> uh, headphones off, you know, JT. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, it was basically a trauma situation, and I was seeing him afterwards uh, at the ward, and uh, he uh, ba- he basically uh, was complaining of pain in his like left temple area, just generally. Oh, no. uh, and people were checking him out every day, but nobody looked in his mouth for some reason. They they forgot to look in his mouth. Um, the, by the way, the trauma situation was recent. This is way longer before, uh, and then that's what caused the thing that I'm going to describe right now. Uh, he came just because of the pain. Uh, we look at it and it's like, oh, it turns out he has an infection of some kind, and it seems like a fairly severe infection, but the, people are looking and it's like, I can't find where, where it is. Uh, but again, they forgot to look in his mouth, or they didn't look very well, at least. So I decided to, I was like, hey, open up your mouth, let me take a look. And this dude had on his left, like, uh, mandible, uh, the the past three molars, uh, the, the, the ones on the back, were almost entirely shattered. Mm. Like, he had, like, one wall up of, of, of a molar. Like, all... Jesus. <laughs> like, basically, one corner of it still sticking out. Oh and the entire God. area around it, like, of, of the... of It, it was... I've never seen anything that black I... <laughs> in my life. Yeah, and I was like, I was like, my guy, you're surprised. Number one, you have pain. Number two, there's an infection. <laughs> uh, and, and there's what... like, there's at that moment, there's like mm-hmm. five American cops jumping yeah. in the room and starting <laughs> oh to my god. Them over. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! Yeah, honestly, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> Jesus Christ. But yeah, um, and then I asked him, I was like, why have you never done anything? He was like, oh, you know, uh, he was be- wearing a Gucci shirt, by the way. That, this course, is important yeah. for the story. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, why haven't you fixed it? He was like, oh, you know, you know how it is, like dentistry is, is expensive, getting your teeth fixed is expensive. I was like, my guy, you're wearing, <laughs> you're wearing Gucci. <laughs> maybe it was a fake, maybe it was a fake, who knows. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it, uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, that's, that's what that reminded me of. Was it the Gucci shirt with Peppa Pig on it? Because yes, that is a fake. But also, I want that <laughs> <No>. shirt. <laughs> <laughs> you should wear it for your next recording, unironically. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say I would like to extend two two apologies. Number one for uh for 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 the boys and for the audience for not for me being fucking uh a wall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for, for the past several, so I've just been very busy with with life and work and everything else. Uh, but now I'm back. I'm to that's number one. Number two, I'd like to apologize to our fantastic guest who's returning for the third time, Alan McLeod, who is a fantastic absolutely brilliant journalist uh who makes banger delivers straight bangers yeah. i would like to say for for the record <laughs> but uh yeah w- w- you haven't heard a word a peep from him because uh, we've been talking disgusting tea things and uh <laughs> yeah well i <laughs> do you want, do you want yeah to... sorry about that Hakeem. i kind of started that <laughs> off with my uh, tooth problems but it's great to be back yeah. although i am kind of feeling slightly in two minds about uh doing this uh specifically because of you hakim it's nothing you've done exactly but let me explain <laughs> mm-hmm. um okay please do. i was having this dream 
a little bit after I went on the second <laughs> show. And in the dream, I met this beautiful girl and we went on a date. And it turns out she was like a super Marxist. And I'm like, oh, nice. OK, uh -huh. it was me. And we ended up <laughs> <laughs> we ended up talking about Marxist theory for quite a lot. Her more than me, frankly. Mm -hmm. And anyway, we went back to my place and I'm trying to move the conversation and the action elsewhere. Yeah. But she just won't mm -hmm. stop banging on about the 18th Brumiere or whatever. And I'm like, oh, honey, there's a time for Marx and there's a time for Sparks. But she just keeps on lecturing me for hours and hours. And I'm like, I don't care about linen. Anyway, at some point later, I woke up and went to the toilet. And I saw that I'd gone to sleep watching a YouTube clip with autoplay on. And it started playing one of your mm -hmm. videos, Hakim, called something like, I answer the questions socialists are asked. And I realized what's happened, mm -hmm. that you were literally polluting my dream, that effectively you had freaking cock-blocked me in my sleep, Hakeem. <laughs> Let's go! Let's go! Oh, I'm, I'm supremely proud of that. I, I would apologize, but you know, you, you learned something. Typical <laughs> Hakeem. Uh, Lennon do oh be important. God. Yeah, exactly right. um, <laughs> borderline like through video cucking, like yeah. like a new <laughs> fucking level oh of cock block. Absolutely Look, impressive. Hey, you, I don't know what to you, tell you. You hear this "hello week. there" and wake up in a cold sweat. <laughs> 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 oh my god! Uh, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, heavy. <laughs> Uh, well, I hope that you'll have very nice dreams tonight, inshallah. Uh, ones that I do not interrupt, and you can carry on to the sparks part, uh, which is, of course, planning, uh, organizational <laughs> tactics, of course, but the more the more important things. Howdy, y'all. Today we have with us fan favorite and friend of the show, the one and only Alan McLeod. Alan's Let's here. Go. He's here primarily to collect his third appearance challenge coin, uh, but we figured <laughs> we would hang out and, and chat a bit, too. Um, if you somehow missed his first two appearances, Alan is a senior staff writer for Mint Press News. He's a published author, and he's had his work featured in a bunch of great lefty outlets. So, Alan, uh, tell our listeners a little bit about what you've been up to, what you're working on, and where they can find your work. He's also originally from the Balkans, most importantly. <laughs> most importantly, yes. Exactly. Originally Albanian, yes. <laughs> <laughs> fuck, shut the fuck up! You both. Yeah, sorry, please, Alex. These are true. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, it's great to be with you guys. Um, I am very happy to be here back on my third appearance. In fact, I insist that I am always the person who's been on this program more than anyone except uh, the presenters here. Inshallah. As you said, yeah, I work at Mint Press News where I'm senior staff writer and podcast producer. I produce uh, my own video podcast, but also a lot of investigations specifically into things like government surveillance and big tech and the links between the national security state and big tech as well. Uh, you might know me from Twitter mostly. That's probably where most people seem to know me. Certainly the normies that I, I meet in, in like, you know, <laughs> Like, you know, my sister's friends or something are like, oh, I've seen you on Twitter. Uh, yeah, I do spend a lot of time on Twitter at Alan R. McLeod. And uh, yeah, you can find me at Mint Press News or on Telegram as well. Lovely. Uh, let's start with a recent article of yours. Uh, in it, you outline how an Israel-linked uh, pressure group called We Believe in Israel, no, affiliated no. with uh, the Britain-Israel Communication and Research Center, also known as BICOM, is actively lobbying the UK government and Spotify to remove artists who support Palestinian liberation. Um, please tell us a bit more about that. How does it work? How it eventually backfired? And what concerns do you raise regarding the potential bias and influence of uh, pro-Israel groups in censoring pro-Palestinian voices on Spotify, if not uh, further? Yeah, so for quite some time, Israel has really been losing the battle for public opinion. It's never really been a popular yeah. state globally, certainly not in the global <laughs> south anyway. But because it has, since 1967, performed a key role for the West in acting as its primary enforcer in the Middle East, the region where, with the most uh, important and profitable commodity there is, uh, it has always been presented very positively and been given enthusiastic support in North America and in much of Europe. But with the maybe with the advent of social media, it's become much more difficult for it and for Western governments to hide the barbarity that it carries out on a daily basis. And its reputation is really tumbling, especially among young people, especially among young Jewish people as well. So in this context, knowing it can't really win a fair fight in the court of public opinion, 
Israel and its supporters have turned to fighting dirty and attempting to censor and suppress voices that oppose it. And mm. one of these platforms is on Spotify, where a group uh, affiliated with BICOM called We Believe in Israel has been leading the campaign to get songs about resistance to Israeli oppression banned for either inciting violence or for anti-Semitism. And We Believe in Israel came across my radar because their number one target, it seems, is my colleague at Mint Press, uh, Loki. Mm. If you don't know Loki's music, you really have to check it out. He's just an absolutely incredible wordsmith, and he's respected in uh, the world over in hip-hop circles and also in the broader entertainment community. Um, Anyway, We Believe in Israel has engaged in a pressure campaign to get Loki's music and others off Spotify, and they've been petitioning the UK government and Spotify itself on the matter. The thing about this is, We Believe in Israel, there's many reasons to suspect that they're not simply an independent group of citizens concerned about anti-Semitism, mm. which, let's be real, is a cancer and a plague upon society. But We Believe in Israel was forced to concede by the British government regulator Ofcom that it worked closely with the Israeli embassy. And its director, Luke Akehurst, is a notorious Labour Party operative who really led the campaign to undermine Jeremy Corbyn and get him kicked mm. out of the Labour Party on bogus anti-Semitism charges. Now, one reason why this Spotify campaign is so threatening is because it started at exactly the same time when the music giant announced its new Safety Advisory Council, the body that would ultimately be in charge of deciding what content would stay up and what would be taken down. Two seats on this council were given to the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, a think tank funded by Western governments, including by organizations that I would argue are front groups for the CIA, including the International Republican Institute and the National Democratic Institute. Uh, the Institute for Strategic Dialogue was founded by Baron Weidenfeld, who was chief of cabinet to Shaim Wiseman, who was the first president of Israel. And today, the Institute's chair is Michael Lewis, who was formerly director of BICOM, which is We Believe in Israel's parent organization. And so mm. BICOM, We Believe in Israel are now petitioning the Spotify Council, where their former director is also in charge of an organization that sits on the panel that will help decide whether to ban or not ban pro-Palestinian artists. Wow. And the plot gets even thicker when you realize that the current Secretary of State for Digital Culture, Media and Sport in the UK, Lucy Fraser, actually used to work at the Ministry of Justice in Israel. And so we've got a situation mm -hmm. where I think BICOM slash We Believe in Israel are trying to knock on doors that they already believe are open to them and get artist censors mm -hmm. for their opposition to the policies of the government of Israel. Um, you did ask me why it didn't really work. I guess with Loki, it didn't work partially because mm, We Believe in Israel's attempts drew a massive counter protest where tens of thousands of people signed a letter demanding Spotify not buckle to the pressure and pointing out the glaring mm. conflicts of interest here. Uh, this included hundreds of the world's most famous artists and entertainers. But this is far from the first time that Israel and its supporters have tried to pull these sorts of tricks. You know, former Israeli Justice Minister uh, Eilat Shaket, I think her name is, uh, she boasted once that she worked closely with Facebook to censor Palestinian voices, with uh, mm. Facebook agreeing to take down around 95% of the content that she asked them to. And today, wow. mm. former Director General of the Ministry of Justice in Israel, Emi Palmore, actually sits on Facebook's Advisory Council, which is the board that ultimately is responsible for content moderation on the world's largest news platform. And then we just constantly see at moments of high tension, such as when Israel invaded Sheikh Jarrah last year and the Al-Aqsa Mosque specifically in Jerusalem, that prominent Palestinian voices have their accounts mysteriously blocked for days. Mm -hmm. And this isn't really the only sorts of censorship and uh, problems people who advocate for Palestinian liberation face. We saw, for instance, in mainstream media, Mark Lamont Hill, a CNN anchor, was fired for his comments about uh, Free Palestine. Nathan J. Robinson lost his Guardian gig for tweeting something critical of Israel. Whereas the German giant Axel Springer, which controls huge amounts of newspapers across Europe and further afield as well, basically makes its employees sign a pledge to say that they are committed to the integrity of the European Union, to free market capitalism, and to the existence of the state of Israel. And they also carried out a purge of Arab and Muslim staff for things they wrote about on social media years and years ago. Mm. And so I guess 
the reason this is happening is because Israel acts as like a 51st state, right? It's like a local cop in the beat in the Middle East. And I would say just like cops everywhere, their violence is either covered up or forgiven by corporate media because Mm. it's often in the service of empire and in capitalism more generally. Yeah, it's. Yeah. I was I was scrolling through Twitter today, and there was just a, there was a new video out of some um, settlers uh, new to Israel, or you know to the military occupation, um, hmm. forcibly removing Palestinians from their homes to occupy it themselves. Like, how on earth can anyone hmm. watch stuff like this and not? see who the aggressors are here and i guess the answer to that is that they don't see it in the first place they, like you said this is not shown on corporate media i've never once heard anything critical of, of israel um on on the mainstream news it's 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 a shame that it's not more widespread the knowledge that this is happening but i am optimistic in the sense that mm. there is such backlash against it now because of social media and the fact that it does spread so widely there no likewise the thing with is uh you First of all, the foundation of that that illegal such a colonial military occupation is honestly on a deck of cards. It's so flimsy yeah. that they have to they have to go to these huge huge leaps, right? Um, there's no major major you know mainstream news platform for Palestinians that gets you know shown everywhere on American news, on European news, etc. Mm-hmm. These don't exist, right? But people still find out about what's going on in Palestine. Meanwhile. The other side is trying their, their their hardest to limit the access of this news, and it still nonetheless gets out. Not only does it get out, but it's disseminated in a way for to push opinions in the correct direction, that being to turn opinions negative against uh, Israel, which is the correct, that is being on the right side of history, mm. um, just like being against apartheid South Africa would have been. Uh, that being said, though, I think... Even with all their attempts, and as pathetic as they may be, uh, showing how how truly sensitive of a regime it is, uh, there is a shift, at least that I've noticed personally, um, in the past, what, like 10 years possibly, um, where prior it was almost exclusively um, pro Israeli coverage, yeah, uh, and the opinion, even general opinion, that you see in amongst Americans and Europeans would be that, um, of course, like Alan said, the vast majority of the global South has always had a negative opinion of Israel since its inception, um, but recently I think even in the imperial core there's a sudden uh, or subtle, excuse me, um, shift towards almost uh, like you know the typical liberal. Oh, it's a balanced thing. It's yeah. not you know either that or you're seeing people even go more towards the correct direction. Like oh yeah, no, it is a legal settler uh, military occupation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So very interesting, very interesting um, that. Their attempts really do boil down to things as pathetic as, oh, we need to take people off of Spotify. Um, yeah. Uh, if your power was really so solid, you wouldn't feel threatened by uh, some guy and some music, but all right. <laughs> yeah, most definitely. And there's not this sort of uh, corresponding campaign from Palestinians to get, you know, people interviewing Benjamin Netanyahu, who says, you know, something about, you know, destroying Palestine constantly or taking the land or whatever. There's never any, like, calls for YouTube to take down videos whereby these government officials are saying this, partially because I don't think they really believe in that sort of uh, that sort of method, but secondly, because they know that it's just going to fall on deaf ears because, you yeah. know, mm. gigantic mega corporations don't give a shit about this. They have literally nothing to gain. I mean, what, what, what you as a mega corporation have to gain by uh, talking... Uh, to the Palestinian voice or sharing uh, sharing the Palestinian struggle. Absolutely no profit motive there. So why would you risk potentially pissing off extremely politically illiterate people that uh, quote-unquote are on Israel's uh, side? Mm. You, you get absolutely nothing. So it uh, it's not going to happen unless, uh, as uh, Hakim uh, put very well, the, 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 the Palestinian side gets just uh, spreads more and more into the, uh, the mainstream. Uh, as successfully as it uh, to this point uh, has even even after this uh, absolute like megadon of uh, uh, you know ant- information state which is uh, Israel and the United States continuously fighting against any sort of uh, uh, real news coverage of the Palestinian struggle uh, going out so uh, it's only it's only a matter of time and what the Israelis are, are doing here together with their allies is you know typical market probing you know first as again repeating what you guys said but one, once you like establish the, the status quo of the view of your settler colonial state as either neutral or positive 
uh, the next thing you do is you start going out there and hunting voices that actively um, carry the opposite opinion of that. Uh, and this, you know, obviously Spotify, YouTube here and there are perfect platforms to probe just how much you can do that without very big backlash. So it's very nice to see that there was big backlash because that's immediately going to communicate to them that, uh, yo, maybe we should uh, wait a bit before we, we try this again or, you know, find a different strategy at uh, uh, on how we're going to do this because simply simply stating something that, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 years ago would have worked that, you know, no Palestinian terrorists are destroying anti-Semitism, blah, 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 you know, the usual classics uh, no longer works. Like people, uh, people will uh, shrug that off and still support artists that they obviously see uh, do not carry any ill intent in their heart, but are only only fighting for uh, for a cause which is so black and white that it like it's almost like a fucking animated movie. Uh, but uh, moving on to like uh, my favorite uh, thing in the world, the modern twist uh, to cocaine, just ten times more addictive and three times more brain melting. Uh, TikTok <laughs> uh, specifically, and I uh, never thought this would uh, come in the same sentence. TikTok e-girls helping recruit U.S. soldiers. <laughs> uh, your article on this was least to say pretty wild, in a good way, obviously. Uh, can you please tell us um, a bit more about uh, psychology operations specialists uh, thirst trapping future soldiers, uh, the U.S. military's adaptation to new media recruitment, and the uh, general role of uh, U.S. military dinero being, quote-unquote, invested into influencers who then in turn go on the internet and call for people to join the good old military. I'm not surprised that you're asking me about this because it seems so on brand for the deprogram. It's also probably my most 2023 investigation ever. Uh, I think... Right? <laughs> yeah, I think I got it through because of the title, From Simp to Soldier, How the Military is Using <laughs> E-Girls to Recruit Gen Z yeah, into Service. That's so good. Bullets are shit. <laughs> <laughs> like, mm. so, <laughs> so yeah, the military is really... I guess it's facing a recruitment crisis right now. The kids, it turns out, just don't want to fight. Not only that, you can't really reach teenagers easily with TV ads anymore, so you've got to go where they mm. are. And we all know that they're addicted to TikTok and other social media. And so that's where the army has gone. And now I found that they're using e-girls on TikTok and Instagram to lure impressionable, young, horny teens into service by getting them to think that if they sign up, they'll meet babes that they see on hashtag MillTalk. The one e-girl that really intrigued me and who I based the piece around is Hayley Lujan. She's a 21-year-old soldier with around three quarters of a million followers on TikTok alone. Jeez. And if you look at her content on Insta or TikTok, it's probably 25% memes, 25% thirst traps, i.e. pictures of her in sexually suggestive clothes or positions, and then like 50% subtle or not so subtle calls for her followers to join the army. And so, for instance, like uh, the thumbnail for one of her most recent videos reads, come with me to airborne school, and her whole shtick is like steeped in multiple layers of irony. And so are her comments, like half of the comments underneath her posts uh, are telling her that she's an obvious psyop and that she's being supported by the Department of Defense. And she really leans into this in her own content herself, calling her, she calls mm -hmm. herself a glowy or a psyop, or she gives her videos Smart. titles like my handlers made me post this. In fact, her mm. personal website is Smart. actually called Psych Ops. So her whole thing is like, am I or aren't I? Mm. But here's the thing, right? She literally is a psyop in the sense that she is a psychological operations specialist in the US Army, one of a small number of army personnel whose job it is to carry out influence and disinfo operations either on or offline. Now, the military is intensely protective of its reputation online. It encourages its personnel to post a lot. So, for instance, the Air Force Media Guide uh, that's given to all employees says that, quote, you are encouraged to use social media to share your experiences as an airman, as your stories might inspire someone to join the Air Force or support the Air Force, mm. end quote. But it also says that sharing the wrong kind of information, i.e. showing the military in a bad light, quote, could jeopardize you and your airman's career, end quote. And so, in other words, what they're saying is we will only permit content we like or else. And so mm. it's clear that the army 
definitely approves of Luhan's content. The only question is whether they're actively directing it. I did ask the Department of Defense about this, but I did not receive a response, unsurprisingly. But I think, yeah. Mm. yeah, nevertheless, Edward Bernays, who is the father of modern propaganda, would probably conclude that it doesn't really matter if Luhan is or isn't an army psyop. The consequence is still getting impressionable young boys and girls to associate lust with the military. And in that sense, they are literally making these people horny for war. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting to see because, like, in the United States... The general vibe is, you know, the flag draping, USA chanting chuds who are super supportive of the military. But then you go online and then you get a, a very different perspective sometimes from social media where you're like, okay, so Gen Z is super anti-US military. So it's I'm very curious to see, and I'm not sure how, how one could, could get accurate information because the U.S. is so big and so populous, what exactly the breakdown is of people, you know, under a certain age uh, who are either supportive of or resistant to U.S. imperialism and these pushes to join the military. It's something that, that fascinates me. I've done a couple of videos on it. And then like looking at um, one of the memes is that you'll get recruiters come to schools and say like, oh, hey, you uh, you sign up now and we'll, we'll put you in a Dodge Challenger. And like, you know, the Challenger and the Charger are like the cars that the, the, the army kids come back and buy. And now they've, the the Challenger and the, and the Charger are on their way out and people are like, oh no, they're never going to recruit again. They're not, how are they going to get these kids to join without the Challengers? <laughs> um, anyway, that's just a little aside, but it is very interesting to see. And I, I, I don't know. It, the reporting seems to indicate, and Alan, you tell me how how accurate this is, that the U.S. is having a real hard time meeting recruitment quotas. Uh, how big of a problem is that for them? Oh, yeah, it's huge. Apparently only 9% of Generation Z are would consider joining the military at all. And the army wow. especially is having a real problem hitting its quotas. Sometimes they're 15 or 25% below the figures that they want. And so the army has actually had to contract considerably. And what you were talking about, the recruits there, I think this is important to connect it to other parts of society. And I want to say just a warning to Americans that free college just isn't coming precisely mm. because one of the only draws for young people nowadays to join the military is that they might get their college paid for uh, by the government rather than having to take out a student loan and pay that back until they're 60 or 70 years old. And so, mm. yeah, the, the military is really trying to recruit from anywhere it can. They're micro-targeting ads to progressives. So, you know, if you're, if you're progressive, you'll see stuff saying, oh, we're LGBT friendly. Or if you're conservative, you might see stuff saying, you know, you know, the traditional flag wearing drapier, yeah. you know, the stuff around. So, yeah, I, I guess uh, the military really is uh, struggling right now. And one thing I did want to also say is that, um, you know, you three are YouTubers and the military is also pumping in clearly a hell of a lot of money into YouTube because mm -hmm. uh, in the last 12 or months or so, a whole bunch of top YouTubers have made videos where they travel to US military bases to quote unquote, join the army for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. And there they climb ropes and build bonds with other people and they play around with cool machinery and it all looks like a great big summer camp. It's vibes. Yeah. As, yeah. And these YouTubers are huge. I'm like, they're seriously big. Like they're bigger than JT huge. And that's saying something, mm -hmm. right? Like Michelle oh, Kari, she's got 3.7 million subscribers made one. Jeez. Ben Azzler wow. has 22 million. He made a, wow. a, a, a recruitment video like this. Doug Sensor Martin has two and a half million followers as well. And they never show the side of army life that might not be so glamorous, right? They're not showing like the... The suicides. Yeah, the physical, <laughs> mental, <laughs> yeah. sexual abuse that's apparently rife. Uh, Instead, it's just Getting like, murked by some cool cool guy in sandals with an RPG, like covering <laughs> his eyes and blasting yeah. him off the road. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's just a wall-to-wall -wall love fest for the military. And these stars are, you know, at the end of the video, they usually do some corny thing where they thank the military for all they do for the country, say they're yeah. heroes, yada, yada, yeah. yada. And in some of these ones, they actually like turn to the camera and they tell their impression young viewers that they too could join up and there's like an affiliate link down below that they can sign yeah, which presumably yeah. means they're getting some sort of <laughs> kickback for every click or yeah, every sign yeah, up they're getting do you think if vpns figured it out the, <laughs> literally the biggest corporation <laughs> yeah. on planet earth the u.s military wasn't going to figure it out eventually yeah yeah i mean oh i find God. that sort of content really insidious because <clears throat> unlike advertising between shows this kind of blurs the line between commercials and content 
because the content is the commercial here. And not only that, it's being delivered through the voice of YouTube stars that young audiences have like developed long parasocial relationships with. So they probably trust and respect these people greatly. Yeah. And I just wonder how much money they're getting out of this because I feel like it, it oh, surely yeah. can't be enough. I'd ask you guys, how much would it take for you to consider doing an army <laughs> recruitment video like these ones? For the PLA, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, oh we're, my God. we we are like, I don't know, three years from someone being like, and if you join today, you can get a golden M4. I was like, yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah. yeah. Like the turning, like loot boxing, joining the military. It's like, oh, man. I mean, it makes sense. It makes sense. That's like you said, that is where people are. That is how you reach them these days. They're not watching TV. They're watching YouTube. They're watching Twitch. They're on TikTok. So yeah, I, I guess we shouldn't be surprised, even though when you see it, it is like, it still feels shocking somehow that that this is a thing because it's our new thing it's yeah. like the the new switch of military ideology there is arguably no other state institution that is more ideological than the military and uh, you know if we go back uh, thousands of years the way you would summon the sons uh, and sometimes even daughters of your country to go into war was linked to numerous be it cultural religious or even sometimes just plain old you know join the army or the other guys are going to roll through your village and uh, do fucked up shit yeah. to your wife and kill you and put your kids in slavery uh, but you know as as the years progressed we found more uh, interesting ways to you know pitch it to ourselves especially when it comes to you going somewhere else and fucking the other guy up instead of defensive wars and up until the 50s 60s even to an extent 70s you could still for when it comes to the American you can still sell the whole you know freedom narrative you can still sell the even even like what worked for progressive super well the whole you will go and you will give them democracy narrative yeah. and blah 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 stuff that sounds absolutely batshit insane today at least hopefully to most of mm. our listeners or at the very least stupid uh but now we've obviously reached a point where it needs to adapt to the to the current ideology mm. of the lands yeah. and kind of america shot itself in the foot by uh, you know it wanted a whole population of uh, consumers that know <laughs> nothing about anything else who's Culture is literally based on uh, brand identity and, uh, you know, what they uh, what they uh, pay for on a daily basis. So it needs to pitch uh, the military to, to a population with such a culture. And obviously it's going to uh, do this through, uh, through people who are considered, I mean, now we're tapping ourselves on the back as podcasters or YouTubers or whatever the fuck, but sometimes much of the people that are considered much closer uh, by the population itself, especially the younger one, than even mainstream celebrities and so on. People that can, that's why Alan beautifully put that it's even additionally insidious, people that are going to watch this type of content uh, uh, and they're going to watch a particular, in this case, let's say YouTuber or TikToker, who they who they have a deep uh, feel a deep connection towards. They don't have a deep connection, but they feel they have a deep connection towards uh, someone who they feel like they can trust because you know this YouTuber I've been watching him for five years. He's been giving me so much advice about so many other things, you know, or how to talk to a girl, or how to redecorate my room. Or, uh, you know, he's been my like long term friend, and now all of a sudden he's telling me to what put a fucking machine gun in my what machine gun. Oh my God, I'm jumping out of a plane. Oh my God, I'm in the fucking jungle. What the, f what the fuck, you know, fucking teleport. You're like, what the fuck just happened? Um, but yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a product of our time. I don't know. That probably like in a in, in hundred years, you know, that the military ads are going to be like, we have designed special levitating chairs. You don't even have to stand up when you shoot at motherfuckers, right? Like those levitating fucking Coca-Cola feeding fucking things from uh, Up. No, Up, not Up, that fucking movie. Wally -E mm -hmm. or whatever the fuck. So... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's going to keep getting weirder and weirder and weirder. And I don't know which one is funnier, like uh, the, the fucking v Wagner doing ads like uh, uh, gamers do nothing for motherland, but now gamers can use skill yeah. to fly drone <laughs> into into fascists, to like fucking stupid shit like this. I don't know if that's dumber or this is dumber, but uh, to each their own, I guess, you know, we will see, uh, we will see where it goes. Uh, earlier this year, you even wrote that uh, several former U.S. State Department Department officials and individuals with backgrounds in the FBI, CIA, and other multi-letter agencies are working in influential positions uh, at
that the US is a branch of TikTok. Something that's like extra funny to me coming in after the whole China TikTok hysteria we saw earlier this year. Uh, tell us a bit more about that, please. Yeah, as you said, uh, uh, you might remember the hysteria during the Trump era that TikTok was this Chinese Trojan horse and the US would have mm. to ban it. And they even reportedly had a done deal to sell it to Microsoft. And then suddenly all of that went quiet and the hysteria went away. Why? Well, now we know most of the story. It was because in 2020, TikTok initiated a move called Project Texas, which was essentially moving all the physical data to a site in Texas. That much was public, but what I pieced together from looking at employment websites and databases is that it also clearly involved the hiring of dozens upon dozens of US national security state officials into TikTok's top ranks, especially into the positions of influence over what users see and what they don't see. And that included the FBI, the CIA, and the State Department, among others. And these officials were, weren't really being put into political neutral positions like customer service, rather they were put into things like safety, security, and just generally control over the algorithm. For instance, TikTok's recruitment coordinator is Katrina Villasisneros. Right before TikTok, however, Villasisneros worked at the State Department's Office of Human Rights and Humanitarian Affairs. And until 2021, she was part of Army Cyber Command Unit, the US military organization that oversees cyber attacks and information warfare online. But perhaps the most startling resume I found in terms of a career change was from TikTok's feature policy manager, Greg Anderson. Now, until 2019, Anderson worked, according to his own LinkedIn, uh, on, quote, psychological operations, end quote, for NATO. Mm -hmm. And that's all his resume said about what he did. Then he moves straight from there into intelligence uh, and countering extremism for Twitter. And since 2021, he's been at TikTok. That is extremely suspicious, in my opinion. Yeah. And according to the resume of TikTok trust and safety manager, Bo Patterson, not only was he a CIA targeting analyst until 2020, and that's probably exactly what you think a targeting analyst is. It's, you know, a lot of what it is is deciding what drone strikes will, you know, hit where. <laughs> He's also apparently currently a serving military intelligence officer in the US Army while moonlighting at TikTok. So <laughs> this whole hoopla is actually quite similar to what happened with Facebook in 2018. If you remember, there was a lot of great concern about fake news on Facebook swinging the 2016 election. And Mark Zuckerberg himself was hauled before Congress where he was made to mm. explain himself in front of politicians who were calling for Facebook to be broken up. And some were even talking about sending Zuckerberg to jail. And just a few Based. weeks... Yeah, well, sometimes a broken clock is right, I guess. <laughs> but not long after that, Facebook announced that it had partnered with the Atlantic Council, which is NATO in all but name, giving the council considerable influence over the curation of billions of users' news feeds, deciding what was reliable information and what was fake news. And of course, anti-imperialist content was just immediately crushed after that. Um, not only that, Facebook's now utterly filled with spooks and spies as well. One example of this I've detailed before is Aaron Berman, who's pretty much the face of content moderation at Facebook. That means he appears in promotional videos for them, talking about how his team treads the fine line between freedom of speech and suppressing hate speech. But in the videos that Facebook put out, however, they don't mention that Aaron was actually a senior CIA analytic manager until 2019. In fact, he was so high up at the organization that he was actually writing the president's daily briefs that were read out to President Trump and probably Obama read them himself in the Oval Office. And since then, he just goes straight from that job and is parachuted into the top of content moderation at Facebook. So yeah, what's going on here? What's going on is that the US government wants to control or influence the means of communication. I mean, who doesn't? But this is especially true over global platforms like TikTok or Facebook. We like to think of tech companies as being transnational existing in the ether, but they really aren't. They're brick and mortar companies based largely in the US. And so they're subject to American laws. And Washington wants to keep the internet that way. They don't want foreign companies muscling in and reducing their influence over the global marketplace of ideas. And now that our media is so concentrated online, we 
mostly only use a handful of websites or apps. It means that he who controls the algorithms really controls what people see and don't see. And this is all happening just completely invisible to most people. It's the same kind of reason why there's so much consternation about Huawei 5G technology right now. It's not that it doesn't work. It's more that the US doesn't really want a competitor nation controlling the infrastructure of the 21st century. The US wants to be able to use this technology to spy on anyone it wants all the time, including foreign leaders of friendly nations like Angela Merkel, and they want to keep it that way. And this TikTok thing is just a microcosm of that. It's basically becoming a new state resource to an extent, you know, yes, sure, you need the coast, you need the, uh, the forests, you need the natural resources of this and that kind. And now, you know, thanks to uh, all of us really liking this whole web browsing <laughs> thing, uh, you need to cover a whole front where, you know, the, the battle for uh, souls and minds is uh, constantly, uh, you know, grabbed at uh, and establish your, your dominance uh, in it. So, you know, the whole conversation about the free enterprise and the free market and so on flies out the window the second that same uh, enterprise can be used by everyday Joes to spread uh, an alternative alternative vision of uh, how the world can be can be set up and not only that but obviously when uh, alternative states enemy states at least considered can come on those platforms and spread their perspectives their ideas and um, cause uh, this or that turmoil but no matter what kind of excuses the the state wants to find some more legitimate or some less legitimate at the end of the day uh, the whole spiel is that uh, trying to you know put their little grubby hands around uh, the one the, the last kind of frontier of uh, uh, complete uh, freedom of expression which is uh, which is the internet and uh, you uh, we kind of fucked up as consumers by concentrating absolutely everything on these massive social media platforms, which are now, it, to, to one extent or another, going into, uh, falling into the hands of uh, different individual, mostly capitalist state-run um, organizations even though you know we had the opportunity in the past of having a much more decentralized internet and so on but you know and now we'll, somebody's gotta pay the piper mm. um, it's super interesting to see where where this 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 whole thing uh, goes i'm not sure how uh, like um advanced other states approach to this is but the u.s is really catching this by the reins and trying to establish themselves in absolutely anything that's either up and coming or already uh, established as a, as a larger social media social media platform and we all know who you know the first guys that can get kicked off of those are whenever uh you know "Quote unquote cleansing extremism comes mm. into place and let's just say that it's not the Ku Klux Klan that gets booted yeah. first yeah. Well, it's a, it's a logical conclusion of, you know, the, from the day the first sponsored slot went on a YouTube mm -hmm. video, this this was always the inevitable conclusion. Like, the people with the most money will control what is seen, what is pushed, uh, who it's delivered to. And a lot of times, this is something that um, is a problem with uh, larger channels. There are, there are things called full integrations, which is what I would consider the, um, you know, the join the military stuff, where an entire video is... An ad, built, basically. yeah, it's an ad built by and and you know quote in collaboration with the sponsor, so that it's as seamless as possible. So it just seems like a standalone video, while the the viewer doesn't or may not realize that the whole thing is an advertisement. And that's just that's you know people lament the decline of YouTube as oh it used to be this this place where people would post the you know really silly memes and stuff. And it's like well yeah obviously it's not going to be that anymore because the stuff that is prioritized is the stuff that makes money. Yeah, beautifully put. And more, much more importantly, I think, is how insidious the process is for these. Like, the worst part about it under capitalism is that a lot of it is very boring. It's, hey, you know, yeah. you do you want these dick pills? Do you want this fucking... <laughs> yeah, it's, it's this stuff, right? Um, or, oh, um, what's the one that... I see it on videos it's just f f solely for an American audience, the one for, for hair loss. The ones, the pills, hymns for hymns. That's the one, right? Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> um, uh, yeah the, these, these, like this stupid shit that you see, the um, mundane stuff. Yeah, yeah, which is the majority of it, which is like still like unpleasant to see, but it's you know. And then you have on this other side this highly, yeah, insidious form, which if you notice, and I think this kind of links, like we're we're beating a dead horse, but 
it's always much less quote unquote integrated into the video even if it is the entire video right like they'll yeah. be in your face about like oh look how cool these guns are look how cool these people are in the military but they won't outright come and tell you join yeah. the military unless you know you, the, the, the guy with the affiliate link right um, <laughs> or they'll do like this soft thing it's like oh yeah it looks like so much fun you know if i could mm. I, you know this this bullshit uh which is a shame but what can you do it's a sign of good things to to look for a silver lining that recruitment into the uh, the imperialist army uh, yeah. of the world um has been falling year by year and it's been in crisis for quite a bit and this is just another w- another way of them trying to reach to the the youth within the US and sheer poverty doesn't seem to be enough of an incentive anymore uh, which is uh, as kind of a messed up situation as it is it's a good thing that they're having this crisis at all yeah to a little bit it, it's I, I don't want to overstate it but it kind of speaks to the character of these younger generations that mm. yes they recognize that they're poor and that this mm. would offer them a way out perhaps out of that poverty but the fact that they're not biting mm. at least it, it at least speaks to a cynicism and a a decline in faith in the american mm. project which is a very good thing uh, yeah Exactly right. Uh, to quote Carlin, uh, it's called the American Dream because you have to be asleep to believe it. Yeah, well, yep. seems like uh, the, the youth have have uh, <laughs> wake up, sheeple. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Have, have woken up. They are now yeah. woke. TM. Um, <laughs> Speaking of waste, uh, it would be a major waste uh, if we wouldn't bring up the most important, unimportant uh, news of the past uh, month or two: uh, the submarine. Uh, well, we have you, such a prominent journalist who hunts bad journalism, as uh, I have you ranked in my <laughs> head at the show. Uh, and no, we won't talk about the details of the case, blah, blah, blah. Who cares? Already been there, done that, like a million by a million outlets. What's more interesting, though, is using it as a small case study on why certain things grab people's attention, while others, which maybe should, don't. Uh, The classic, oh, you didn't talk about the hundreds of Pakistanis dying on a refugee boat, but you're obsessed over a bunch of millionaires basically ritually money pig style executing themselves. Uh, This makes absolute sense as a moralist position, but the more interesting question is, is why? Why is it that some stories captivate so much and yet others don't? Is it simple desensitization on hearing about how the poor and the working are annihilated on a daily basis or is it something different that's a really tough question i guess there's a phenomenon in in journalism studies called the man bites dog phenomenon which means that um you know something like dog bites man is so common nowadays that uh, it will never get into the newspapers but when if a man bites a dog that's uncommon enough to the point where that's actually mm-hmm. newsworthy that it happens and i guess billionaires dying well they weren't billionaires but very wealthy people dying down below hunting for the titanic was sexy enough and interesting enough and unusual enough that it you know makes worldwide stories uh all over the place you know literally front page news in pretty much every continent in the world it's kind of similar to something that's called missing white woman syndrome whereby If a rich white lady goes missing, suddenly that becomes newsworthy. Whereas if a poor black lady in the United States goes missing, nobody really cares. And it's certainly not going Mm. to inspire a lot of uh, column inches or, you know, uh, stories on TV news or whatever. I think with this submarine thing, it's kind of politically neutral in a way. It's a very interesting, it's quite a titillating story. It's got the Titanic angle, but perhaps more importantly, there's no real political message here. It's just, oh, isn't this interesting? Why don't you get involved in this? Whereas with the Mm. refugee stuff, I think if you have to cover that at all, people will start asking very inconvenient questions. They'll start asking, why are Mm. they coming? Shouldn't we be helping them? What's happening in their countries that is causing them to leave and come over here? And the minute you start asking that, you start getting into this very uncomfortable territory for people who own Mm -hmm. media outlets or perhaps are high up in government because ultimately these people are coming from places like Syria, Afghanistan and Libya. They're not coming from countries like, for instance, Saudi Arabia or Jordan. And the reason that they're not coming from those countries is because the United States and its NATO allies haven't destroyed those countries with bombs. They haven't turned those countries into just craters. And so 
when people don't have their countries smashed up, they tend to like stay there. But ultimately, it would force us to start confronting the fact that these people are coming as a direct consequence of Western imperialism. The fact that these countries were turned into, you know, open air slave markets in some cases. So it really opens up a lot of questions that I don't think people in the media really want the public to really start thinking about. And that's doubly so as it seems like the Coast Guard might have even been responsible for this sinking in the Mediterranean. So really, I think it's just more politically uh, expedient to cover rich people's troubles rather than the troubles of hundreds of poor people. And that's always been the case. I mean, our media is run by and for the wealthy. And so Mm. plane crashes get much more uh, airtime than bus crashes, specifically in many reasons, because one, they're slightly less common, but two, rich people are involved rather than poor people. And so ultimately, in our media, rich people, when they suffer a tragedy, they're considered worthy victims. But when, you know, poor people of color who are fleeing from the consequences of our wars and our uh, economic and military and foreign policy decisions, when they try and desperately search for a better life and they die in some way, they're basically considered unworthy of any sort of news attention. And so ultimately, I think that kind of explains the disparity in coverage. God damn, was the, 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 the coverage of that nonsense was... Uh, yeah. What's the word? Of, what's the fucking word in English? Um, obnoxious. That's the word. It was mm. so... Fi- who cares? Genuinely, actually, unironically, who gives a shit? Five dudes went up in a, in a tube everyone. and then went to... Who cares? All right, let them... Yeah. Yeah, okay. But that's why it's fascinating. Yeah. Apparently, absolutely everyone. That's why it's so interesting. Like, not the story itself, but like the situation that arose. You, through it. Alan explained and, it so beautifully and so eloquently yeah. why the, 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 there was the captivation, the interest of it. But nonetheless, it's like the most interesting fucking story, the uh, most interesting part of that story to me was the fact that they used like a, you know, like those cheap... Uh, the Logitech controller? Yeah. <laughs> 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 they used the like DK the bongos, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the fucking ones. Like it's like when you, when, when you want to run some emulators and your dog shit fucking like uh, yeah. uni PC or something, it's, <laughs> right? Yeah. You just yeah. want to play some PlayStation 1 games. Um, Hang on, let me steer this with my roll-up Mad Cat's (laughs) DDR controller. Can you imagine if you got into a helicopter and the guy had, like, the controller for Guitar Hero and was like, hop aboard? Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. that's cool. He absolutely shredded on that thing. All right, (laughs) moving aside from, from, again, the the obnoxious media coverage uh, of things most people don't care about, um, moving on to something that probably more people care about. There's been so much noise around this uh, uh, Ukraine joining NATO nonsense. Um, specifically over the past couple of months leading up to the summit that's currently ongoing. Um, we'll see what, what uh, man-made horrors beyond uh, our <laughs> comprehension <laughs> will be will be generated. But uh, following all this, you know, uh, hubbub love, as I've said before, uh, <laughs> about, still kills Ukraine me. Join, yeah, about Ukraine joining NATO, um, just a few days ago, the White House has made a statement essentially squashing any hope of that, saying that Ukraine will not join NATO anytime soon, and specifically and especially not while uh, the war is ongoing. Uh, they'll, they're going to continue supplying them with weapons, of course, but uh, this uh, showed a interesting development within media, at least from what I've seen. Some sides have basically continued to be very gung-ho on Ukraine joining NATO, but other um, media representatives, I guess, have done a complete 180 before they were super pro the, the, the idea and now they've done a 180 and essentially giving excuses along the, the, the State Department, U.S. State Department line. My, my question to kind of summarize this is, how do you interpret this particular development? That some of them did 180, some of them continue to be pushing for it. Is there some sort of like cohesive pro-Ukrainian war journalist complex uh, that agrees, <laughs> a cabal that agrees on what the opinions will be? Please uh, enlighten us. Uh, whenever I think of Ukraine, I just get more depressed and depressed. I think To me, I think it's kind of clear that this war isn't really going well for anyone. It's now been more than a year since Russia invaded. The Ukraine counteroffensive, likewise, has stumbled as we're speaking right now. Tens of millions of people have fled. Who knows how many people have died. Entire cities have been destroyed. We're living with the threat of a nuclear catastrophe every day. And we've also got these horrible columnists who are just armchair freaking Kissingers who are just like yeah. so gung ho <laughs> and so bloodthirsty and so willing to just preemptive throw... nuclear strikes. Okay, yeah, oh, yeah. Jesus, <laughs> good. They're wanting <laughs> to throw <laughs> as many bodies, dollars, mm. and whatever down a bottomless pit. I guess 
if you're a newspaper columnist or you know you work for some horrible news organization there's never really been a downside to being as callously pro-war as mm. possible i don't think mm. i can think of a single journalist ever in my experience anyway losing their job for being too pro-war it just doesn't happen mm. I mean the inverse though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. If you start opposing war, you run into all sorts of problems like we saw in Iraq with people like Chris Hedges, yeah. Phil Donahue, Jesse Ventura, all these guys lost their slots in primetime TV mm. or at the New York Times or whatever. And it continues to this day. Um in terms of Ukraine joining NATO, I don't know. I I believe it was President Zelensky himself who said that he was told in a meeting that Ukraine would not be allowed to join NATO, but that the military alliance kind of wanted to publicly use it as a sword of Damocles, like mm. a, a threat mm. to, against Russia. So I think ultimately, I reckon the status quo is kind of what the West would be relatively happy with, where they're relatively content to transfer weapons to Ukraine as long as they're tying down Russia into a costly war. But yeah. for Ukrainians, this really might not be such a great deal. I mean, it basically means that the war will be prolonged, perhaps indefinitely, and no progress can be made. And so ultimately, while Westerners might pay with their tax dollars or pounds or euros, it's Ukrainians that are actually paying in blood f for all of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, exactly right. It just reinforces the fact that at the core of all this bloodthirsty uh, nonsense these calls for like senseless violence um the only people to actually suffer like i'm not i don't mean like two months from now, let's say five ten fifteen years from now um when whatever happens happens whatever's left of ukraine afterwards or um even in best case scenario however way you 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 like wrap your head around that significant damage to infrastructure will remain lots of people tens of thousands hundreds of hundreds of thousands not even millions of ukrainians would have left ukraine which according to current um uh, whatever uh, unofficial uh, census data that does exist um has way below the 42 million or whatever population uh, that they claim to have had um so the economic performance of whatever state to, to, to follow this will be severely stunted, right? Um, if they were to even join the EU and whatnot, they're just going to become a vassal state like Romania or Portugal or Greece or another one of these, and they won't see any significant development or improvements like Moldova. They're just going to be another country like that, um, a source of cheap labor and, and cheap resources. There is no way you can kind of like uh, circle this point in a way that ends up with a net benefit in 15 years from now. Aside from trying to bring about peace in some relevant and sensible way going into the future. But this is, again, a discussion for the parties uh, on the ground, of course. Um, it's interesting, I think, also that the left in Ukraine, whatever's left, whatever has, whatever is left of the left in Ukraine, um, mm -hmm. after being decimated by fascist gangs and whatnot, um, their voices are suspiciously absent uh, in a lot of these discussions, which I think is a real shame. But, uh, yeah, uh, the decision isn't in our hands, apparently. It's in mm. Washington's <laughs> at this point. Uh, and, and to oh. a lesser extent, Moscow's as well. But, uh, yeah, uh, until until the last Ukrainian body, uh, NATO will fight, I'm sure. Mm. Uh, moving on to another very interesting development, also in this NATO vein. Uh, there has been this... Uh, you, you're well aware of the, the exercises in the East Pacific and how, for example... China's being surrounded by, by this troop buildup and these uh, exercises they're doing over there. Um, but the statements that have been made are genuinely ridiculous. Like how Germany was saying that, that we're not trying to antagonize China. Yes, we're sending troops to, to but we're not trying to antagonize <laughs> you guys. Or, or the American statement where they're like, oh, we aren't surrounding China to surround China. I was like, okay, <laughs> all right, just, my okay. guy. Coincidence, yeah. <laughs> um, my, my question to you is how how is it that they can get away with such very clear Double thing. If I'm allowed to 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 quote uh, literally 1982, um, <laughs> how, how do they get away with this nonsense? Yeah, I mean, what's going on there is probably going to dominate the 21st century news. I think that and climate change will be the two big yeah. stories of mm. the 21st century. And when you look at these big stories, I think the one thing you really can't get away from when you consider geopolitics, and if you don't look at this, you'll never really be fully uh, aware of what's going on, is that the United States is an empire and it considers itself yeah. a global empire too. And that means it looks to control the entire world. And the US has really singled out China as a major threat to its ambitions for quite a long time. Although probably most of us remember Trump's obsession with China, especially during COVID, 
The military maneuvers against Beijing really began under Obama in 2012, I think it was, with his so-called pivot to Asia, which meant Mm -hmm. pooling resources from the Middle East and concentrating on encircling China, which... I mean, incidentally, where do they think Iraq and Afghanistan are? Like South America or something? I never really understood why (laughs) Americans think Asia is like China, (laughs) Japan and two other countries. But that's an aside. Um, Yeah, I guess uh, in the late 20th century, the US thought China was slowly moving towards capitalism and it considered it a very useful workshop where they could get cheap labor to make extra profits. But certainly under President Xi, anyway, it's become increasingly obvious that that's not really happening, certainly not how the U.S. wants, anyway. And so the U.S. has been building up huge forces in Asia. It recently signed a deal for four military bases in the Philippines. It's turning Australia into a giant U.S. base, that na- and it has a network of over 300 of these things encircling Beijing already. And in addition to this, there's been a massive propaganda blitz aimed at everyone trying to get people scared of China again. And it's been really successful. You know, as Mm -hmm. recently as 2018, the majority of Americans, when polled by Gallup, I think it was, had a positive or very positive view of China. But now that number is only 15%, with 84% having a negative or very negative view. So the US is clearly preparing for a war with China, not only militarily, but ideologically too, that much is clear. Whether that war will actually ever happen is another matter. At the same time, they're insisting none of this is actually happening. Well, why do that? So I finally got to your question. Well, <laughs> I, guess it's the, I guess it's the standard practice for all empires throughout history to pretend that they just want peace. You know, the Romans mm. always said that they wanted peace even as they were encroaching uh, into others' lands. The imperial Japanese did this uh, in World War II, saying they were just trying to bring the, you know, the delights of the earth to places like China, even as they were robbing them blind and destroying them. Nobody really says, hey, we're going to attack in a few years because, well, their populations, for one, wouldn't like it, right? But also because it's natural for humans to want to be the good guy. Nobody ever likes to think of themselves as the aggressor. So there's always some excuse as to why you had to attack. Usually that's presented as defending yourself or, you know, maybe in this case it will be defending Taiwan from China. But I would just say that I'm sure the people of Taiwan probably won't be thankful if the United States turns their island into the next Ukraine. Yeah. What's more disappointing, I think, even, at least as of someone outside the US, is how easily the American population is duped into this. Of course, every population is susceptible to a particular kind of like opinion orienting propaganda as long as it's delivered to them in a way that they will be receptive to it. But the United States just seems so easily swayed. American people just seem so easily swayed by whatever the State Department line is. It's incredible what kind of... Again, uh, Yugopnik, you had this joke where you said about uh, uh, where a KGB agent and the CIA agent get together and uh, the CIA agent is pat- patting the KGB agent on the back saying, oh yeah, you guys do amazing work. And the KGB agent looks back and says, uh, yeah. oh yeah, but uh, <laughs> nothing like you guys. Um, our, like, our, prop- our propaganda doesn't hold a candle to what you uh, can get away with. And he's like, uh, what are you talking about? The, the US doesn't have propaganda. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so. It's true. It's, I've, I've, it's speaking to like some older relatives and stuff like that, um, it's a particular flavor of Orientalism, I think, where they've been presented with this country that is very, very old. It's got an incredibly long, storied past. Mm. And so they can, if you say, oh, look, why are you afraid of China? You know, they, what have they done to us in the last, since our country has existed? And they're like, ah, you see, China's very old. They play the long game. They're waiting to do, they've been planning this for hundreds of years. Like, what the hell are you talking about? Mm. So it's a, it's a particular mm. kind of, of viewing them as an other that is very... Um, that is nefarious and patient, I think. Mm. And now, you know, the, it's... I, I support it's a, China's 300-year plan. <laughs> okay. <I don't> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've been, they've it. been plotting this since before the United States <laughs> existed. Exactly. The need the need for the white woman to have a Jew, yeah. like, oh, uh, like enemy. Like, yeah. But you, you can't call it, you, know, you can't do the Jew now, so it's the Chinese. Yeah. And then, you know, Honestly, yeah. Uh, it's literally Orientalism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm going to put that on my tombstone, the need for the white man to fight to have a Jew. I don't know, maybe propaganda works primarily on populations that just 
aren't really that engaged i guess a lot yeah. of uh, mm -hmm. people who are actually engaged in this kind of know what's going on but mm. the sort of like level of knowledge about other countries uh, in the united states or in a lot of countries actually is very very low i remember seeing yeah. a report that said that only 23 percent of americans can find iran on a map but suddenly people just kind of hear oh we've got to defend taiwan and it's like yeah yeah sure whatever mm. because Ultimately, I think Americans are kind of insulated from the consequences of what war actually looks yeah. like. And it's the same with the uh, British and French and whoever. They don't actually see the effects of the bombs dropping. They don't see the mothers crying, you know, holding the pieces of their dead children or whatever. They don't see the, the sewage lines and, uh, and the infrastructure just completely broken and busted. They don't see the misery. And so mm. war to them is like a few extra yeah. dollars from their taxes or whatever. Yeah. Or the hyper, you know, hollow, hollowedized kind of like image of like, oh, America, fuck it, let's, yeah. you know, uh, shock and awe and like, yeah. What's it called? I remember that, that Fox News uh, presenter and he's talking about some bombing of that was happening in Afghanistan by American uh, planes. And he's talking about how that is the manifestation of the glory of the United States. And I was like, motherfucker, Jesus people Christ. are dying. What is yeah. wrong with you? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Lord. Yeah, I mean, we've never had a real a real conflict on yeah. our soil. We, it's never bitten us in the ass. Mm. And I think it. I think that is what it would take for the average American to be shaken from this fantasy that war is something that is good or necessary or you know glamorous or whatever our entire culture is built around valorizing these these mm. horrific events and whether that's in our you know in hollywood like you said or call of duty battlefield any number of these these long standing video game series that make it enticing that make mm. it uh, beautiful in a dark way i think much more importantly and much more depressing i think is the way that not not to like kind of harp on this haha american stupid point that's not what i'm trying to say but there is a certain ignorance that that population is steeped in not out of their own fault but it's targeted in, towards regular americans n not only through lack of access to information um generally uh, ease of access to it but also through just how difficult life is for poor americans um that of course that doesn't excuse not being not knowing what's up but uh I, at the same time i think it reflects a depressing reality of regular american life which is um i i don't even like have enough money to pay my rent and to get like you know food for my kids and whatnot uh or i i don't i might be homeless if i you know when you have these kind of uh things on your plate compared with for example a subsistence farmer in kenya um the, the the reality of late stage capitalism kind of forces you to to become super like isolated and look only inwards um but yeah there's a better thought in there that would need to be developed uh it's a lot more complicated than americans are stupid and also a lot more complicated <laughs> than uh, oh they're so poor uh but they need to you know uh but yeah um <laughs> Yeah, I think we can move on to a much more much more fun topic, which is the very last thing that we'll ask of you, uh, Alan, which is this. Uh, please, please hit us with uh, some of those absolutely uh, beautiful headlines that you've maybe <laughs> perused uh, over your time recently. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, <laughs> I've got a real obsession with the Washington Post, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. I kind of uh, read it and hate it at the same time. Uh, mostly hate yeah. it, frankly. And one of the reasons I hate it is because it's publishes articles with uh, titles such as My Father, Henry Kissinger, is turning 100. This is his guide to longevity. And I'm like, this guy is... <laughs> oh, this guy is... Be vampire, blood! <laughs> it's like, this guy is like literally Dr. Evil. He's put millions yeah. of people in the ground. He tried, mm. He's tried to put millions more. Somehow the world has uh, survived his rampage across against mm. humanity. It's, you know, frankly, a miracle that that happened. And the Washington Post is publishing stuff, you know, presenting him as some sort of like 
diet expert. I mean, what's he going to say? Oh, like drink a smoothie every morning or something. I don't know. Or maybe he's saying, oh, yeah, drink a blood of virgins. Yeah, yeah, drink yeah. a blood smoothie of like, you know, uh, Vietnamese children or something. One thing yeah. that, that really annoys me about this headline is that if you actually click on the URL, the URL says washingtonpost.com slash Henry Kissinger birthday appreciation. So it was even worse oh before. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> oh Lord. Of course, birthday. Wow. Hey, you know what? I think it's it's kind of a testament to uh, how how long you can live just being an absolute ghoul. Yeah. By the way, if you look at him, by the way, he doesn't even, he looks evil. It's just, you see it yeah. in his face. Uh, of course, well, there's material thing... relation, but yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say the thing with this, like all you need to do if you are a truly evil, heinous person is survive. If once you reach a certain age, you will be recuperated. Your yeah, your yeah. image will be whitewashed. That's just yeah. how it goes. Uh, that's exactly. true. Hey, George Bush Literally, is yeah. a perfect that's example. Fucking yep. Kissinger, mm-hmm. Kissinger is exactly. the guy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Ad- Adolf really fucked up with that suicide <laughs> yeah. shit. Yeah. Uh, you <laughs> know they would have just stayed around, you know bro. Would've... You fucking chancellor of Germany twenty years later. Guys, I'm fucking. I'm fucking. One hundred percent sure, bro. Dude, the guy who who wrote <laughs> the Nuremberg laws for like miscegenation, like the mixing of blood and whatnot for for the Nazis. That dude. You will not fucking believe it. He was dis- his court case at the Nuremberg trials was dismissed on, uh, and I quote, lack of evidence. The guy who wrote, you know, his signatures on the, oh, the entire fucking thing, and afterwards he was he was fined five hundred marks. That's it. That was Jesus he got Christ. he got a slap he got basically a slap on the wrist as if he ran, ran a red light. That's what happened for for yeah. <laughs> fucking hell. Good Sorry. God. Hit, hit us with another, please. All right, this is a recent one from the Guardian, which uh, I think it's a really. Mm, totemic and uh, we can kind of learn a lot from it the title is palestinian journalist hit in head by bullet during raid on terror suspects home and it's just what the hell it's just Just a bullet a a masterful use of the passive voice there i mean ultimately what happened was if you read between the lines the israeli military went and demolished some guy's house in palestine and then shot a journalist in the head who was trying to cover it but, you know, you'd mm. never get that from actually reading the headline. The headline mm. makes it sound like the freaking NYPD hit him or something, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> Palestine. It's a guy called Bullet. Yeah, bro! Yeah. Boom! Yeah. Fucking in the head, in the head by like, Bullet. What, what did someone push the bullet into him? Or, yeah. You know, yeah. Like, I wonder which bullet? direction did it go? Yeah, exactly. How? <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, we don't know who did it. It was just a bullet that hit him, you know? They are really straining yeah. the English language there. Yeah, exactly. And the next part of it is terror suspect as well. It's oh. like, you know, that's... That's clearly the Israeli position on yeah. what was going yeah. on, rather yeah. than uh, the Palestinian yeah. position, right? Of course. Mm. No, no, the guy who was taking pictures of literally l- literal armed uh, settler colonial agents <laughs> of imperialism demolishing some poor guy's home. These people aren't the terrorists, okay? But yeah. the guy who was just taking the photos, all right, he just got bonked, <laughs> is what they're trying <laughs> to tell you, all right? <laughs> he uh, slipped and fell and... Through no one's fault. It, w- it just happened, yeah. Uh. Yeah, you've got to really watch out fell for the a passive <laughs> voice because it's a fantastic way that journalists and media oh, yeah. more generally can talk about violence without appropriating blame. And almost mm. always they're doing that to protect the powerful. Yep. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you gotta watch out for accidentally getting bonked by a bullet. Apparently, mm. <laughs> of no of no one's fault. All right. <laughs> uh, what about um, from Market Watch? Americans may have to start working younger and retire older. That might be a good thing. Mm. Oh my god! Of course, of course it is. I mean, and it's a picture. <clears throat> and it's a picture of an old guy. Very clear old guy. As he's working on some stitching or something. God, god damn. <laughs> yeah, it's like a good thing for who MF or for you know mm. the bosses or for the um, for mm. the you know capitalists who are making money off them. Yeah, but clearly not for us. You shouldn't be working mm. at you know 60, 70, 80, 90 years old and still feeling like you have to work. Uh, because you don't have the the necessary funds to actually live mm. your final years in happiness. Mm. And this other one that I'm going to share with you just now from uh, Fox News, uh, this course. is a real fantastic American example. I feel like I'm the lucky one. McDonald's employee turns 100 years old with no plans to retire. Oh, wow. Much <sighs> this one fills me with rage and also the, with this despair. This poor person, man, that disgusts yeah me man oh lord and we all know so many people yeah. like this. we know so many people that are going to be like this when they're hopefully i, I wish everyone to live to 100 uh, like it's so fucking sad hmm. oh yeah i mean imagine comparing her to kissinger i mean she's literally probably like cleaning out toilets in the mcdonald's yeah. right now as she's 100 years old and this is being yeah. presented in our corporate media as like a happy you know feel-good story right 
that uh, this is a, you know a special interest and you know a fun little tale of uh somebody you know bucking the odds and doing well when in fact it should be presented as like tales of a late capitalist dystopia right yeah yeah it's like you know when you watch or read about dystopias and you're always like you know, this doesn't feel really like that, that believable like either the writing's not that good or whatever because of one main reason you know how are all these people like just going ahead with it like they've accepted it as like normalcy but then you reach it like this and you see the retweets and reshares and the positive upvotes and oh my god like this is the dream and you realize no nah man mm -hmm. yeah. it's absolutely possible as long as you it's boil the frog slow possible. enough yeah yeah, well, exactly. I, I just want to uh, I just want to remind people that in the Soviet Union, retirement age for men was sixty, for women was fifty five. If you had so called quote unquote difficult work, you could retire five years earlier, and if you had underground, hot or unhealthy quote unquote work, then you could retire ten years earlier. So basically, as a man, if you had some sort of like if you're a mine worker, you get to retire at fifty, basically. Uh, and this is uh, saved on the official like uh, Social Security um, Administration government website. The American government website. They have an entire document talking about social security within the USSR and talking about basically how fucking good it is. <laughs> but yeah, anyways, that's the um, in case in case you you forget in case people ever forget that there is an alternative. Yeah, absolutely. All right, the last one I'll share with you. I did say I hate the Washington Post, so I'll, I'll do a four parter here. I don't know if I shared any of these in the last time I was here, but some of my all time favorite headlines from the Washington Post include. Quote, America suffers from too much democracy. Oof. Number two, it's time to give the elites a bigger say in choosing the president. Three, <laughs> that's a classic. I love that one. Yeah. War with Iran is probably our best option. Mm. And number four, <clears throat> Biden has requested an increase in defense spending. It's not nearly enough. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. Not nearly. Agreed with all of it. Look, we are starting to donate 60% of our Patreon income to, <laughs> to the American military industrial complex. Uh, Washington Post has convinced me. I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm all in this. We, re we are renaming the show to The Program. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. We would make so much money. Oh, my God. <laughs> we, we could post the best oh thirst traps. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. If, all, if all three of you did like a right wing turn all at yeah, the same no. time. Damn. Oh, Ooh. Lord. Yeah, Being you heard incredible. it here first, folks. I, I'm I'm currently working on my why I left the left video. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting to see him on what's it called on PragerU. Yeah. Oh, oh. oh, dude, you doing your no, your I, narrator I, voice on PragerU? Yeah. <laughs> I, I I will say it live, like yeah. in front of all of our audience. If Hakim or JT ever do that, I will find them and I will kill yeah, them. Yeah, give you permission. I, I, yeah. Like I'm putting this, I'm putting this oh, out yeah. there. I, that's it. Mm. Oh my god. <laughs> Although I do think that we generally do, we should make a meme one, a meme Prager you thing. But it, <laughs> that would be really funny. Oh my god. We'll we'll think about that. Would that would be great. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that about does it for me. I've had enough of these ridiculous headlines. Alan, we would like to thank you once again for coming on, for collecting mm. your third Very appearance much. challenge coin more exactly. than any other of our beautiful <laughs> guests. Um, always a lovely guest and always, always welcome. No, we're not having favorites here, but you're here for yeah, a third yeah, time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You are the yeah, favorite. Yeah, I just yeah. wanted to know. The pleasure is all <laughs> There's mine. a reason you get requested so often, is, is all we'll say. You're always a pleasure. Oh, the so, pleasure has been mine. Oh, shucks. Well, we'll mm -hmm. give you one more chance to, to plug anything you want to plug just so it's fresh in our listeners' minds. Alan, give us what you're working on. Uh, yeah, just uh, check out mintpressnews.com. That's where I write all my stuff. Uh, you can check me out at Twitter, Alan R. McLeod, or you can check me out on Instagram as well, alan.r.mcleod. All right, absolutely. Everyone, please go and do that stuff. Alan is a fantastic person, fantastic journalist, and we will have him back on many more times in the future. Inshallah. With all that being said, this has been The Deprogram. I'm JT. I'm Hakeem. I'm Gopnik. And I'm Alan. Alan is, is Albanian. I think it's confirmed. <laughs> <Yeah>. No. <laughs> delete that. Please, delete it. Yeah.